Hi, hi everyone. I'm uh, Diego Levera. I'm a principal here at Coda Capital. Um, today, our guest is Garrett Larson, CEO and co-founder of Rumbus. Hey Garrett, everyone. <laughs> um, so Garrett founded Rumbus in 2016 when he and his co-founders saw in the physical security space something ripe for disruption. It was a market primarily served by incumbents with legacy hardware solutions. Fast forward to today, Rumbus is a cloud-based uh, physical security solution with over 1,400 customers, and they are getting to 100,000 deployed devices right now. Uh, our conversation today is a, intended to be a primary on computer vision. So Garrett, uh, welcome to Code Access. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So uh, I know we're going to talk about uh, various um, aspects and dimensions of AI, machine learning, computer vision, uh, but maybe I'd love to start with what is computer vision? Can you uh, tell us why is it so relevant today? Yeah, so uh, I think it's so relevant today because uh, computer vision is the ability to, for specifically to put it in like real terms, like for cameras to understand what's going on in the world, to uh, actually look at an image, be able to say there's a dog and a cat in there, and why it's so relevant today is, is that it's made huge progress. I was actually doing a little bit of research last night uh, after uh, some of our conversation yesterday, and it made a big leap forward in 2012. And that leap forward really uh, meant that computers got a lot better at interpreting images. And the real world application that everyone kind of sees in the media today is uh, self-driving cars. And so uh, it's, it's made some big leaps forward and uh, it's made a lot of progress since in the last 10 years. Yeah, no, this is based on like what you see also in your business right yeah. now. Uh, can you help us understand the, the difference of computer vision in the past, how it started, how it's going right now? Yeah. It feels like a lot has evolved. It's, it feels like in the past, was a, there was still a gap between academia and, and real world situations. Yeah. Do you think that still happened? And uh, how help us understand what is like happening right now in computer vision? Yeah. so. I think with anything with academia, there's always a gap. Academia is sort of at the bleeding edge of a lot of technologies. A lot of times, though, it's not uh, commercialized. It's not very scalable. It, usually it takes uh, industry to actually bring those products to market. I think the same was true in, uh, with computer vision. A lot of these projects that you see uh, today started in academia, uh, which is great. And it's where you need them to start. Uh, but it's really for industry to start commercializing that. And that really started happening a lot in computer vision around like 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this uh, project called, which was famous, uh, called AlexNet, uh, which in 2012 uh, went into this competition. I think it's called ImageNet. And they won the competition with a convolutional neural network. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of started, I would say, this, uh, what's the right word? Like this avalanche in computer vision that started off everything. And then you get, say, the self-driving cars like Waymo. I think Cruise was founded in 2013. We were founded in 2016, kind of mm -hmm. on the basis that you could do a lot more uh, with computer vision that you could in the past. Like, you know, is it a dog? Is it a person? Is it Diego walking into the office? And I think uh, what we're on the precipice of, precipice of is really exciting in, in computer vision. So is it fair to say that now kind of like the 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 timeline between academia research and new breakthroughs in, in algorithm, if you will, mm. to seeing that in real life in the wild, it's getting shorter. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. I think it probably depends on the field, but uh, yeah, I, I could see that it happens a lot. I, it seems like in general technology uh, life cycles or timeframes have are comp are shortening in all in all aspects. Oh, that's great. And yeah. um, maybe if you think about it, like in the future. Yeah, uh, it feels like there's it, it's this specifically on computer vision and AI as a whole is evolving super quickly and yeah. and there's always something new coming up. How do you think about this in like five, 10, 15 years time? Like if you fast forward, uh, you pick the, the horizon. Yeah. Uh, what kind of like infrastructures needs to be in place? What kind of applications that it's going to happen uh, for that vision and the promise of computer uh, vision to happen? Yeah, so that's a very, it's a very big question. We might have to break that into, into different segments here. Uh, but I think what, and I'll try to like organize my thoughts well, but I think we saw this major breakthrough in computer vision. I kind of alluded to it. Uh, the big breakthrough was CNNs. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but 
uh, what enabled that to really happen was uh, more scalable infrastructure, essentially Moore's law uh, caught up and was able to let CNNs uh, do computer vision much better, mm -hmm. GPUs, and then the ability for data labeling. So we had this big step forward in uh, computer vision that was really happened in the last 10 years, call it from like starting in 2012, but it's really been recent. And uh, so we got this big leap forward. And now I think we're at the next stage where we need applications built on top of it. And uh, Rhombus is one example. We're doing things like, uh, you know, advanced computer vision. Like, is it a human? Is it a person? Is it a vehicle? License plate recognition, all those types of things. But uh, we're just one example. And I think there's all types of examples that need to build built on top of this. So like this new technology came about. Now, how do you build useful applications for the consumer, uh, for the enterprise uh, that go with that? And I think you're going to see a lot of companies like us over the next five or 10 years that are essentially building off of this foundational layer mm -hmm. of computer vision that's been uh, unlocked. And uh, another big one, of course, is self-driving cars. And you're going to see that uh, you're going to see some failed companies because they're going to try things and it, there's no real value there. But uh, I think you're going to see a lot of innovation in this space because I think, and we'll probably talk about this later, I think there's a lot of opportunity to be unlocked in this space with these recent developments. So, so maybe one, one of the dimensions, I guess, to unlock all of this uh, yeah. promise lies a lot on talent. Yep. So it feels like everyone knows that talents in, in not only the Bay Area, but like globally is uh, for top engineers, top AI engineers specifically, yeah. it's really uh, uh, you know, hard to find and hard to keep. Yeah. Do you and and I think like competition right now usually used to be big tech. Now like a, a bunch of very interesting high growth companies like yours are scooping very good talent. Yeah. Do you, how do you see the flow right now of talent across the board, and and do you think that's going to ease up any anytime soon? I mean, having worked in tech for what is it like 15, 20 years? I mean, there's always a shortage of talent. <laughs> like it's just it's unending. I think also with this field it's so new like you're a lot of times you're taking people that maybe had no background in this field and you're trying to train them up we do that a lot at rhombus uh especially like with computer vision ai like a lot of times you'll take people from with like a math background and maybe they have never done anything in this field but you just want people that generally know how to think in this kind of space mm -hmm. uh so yes, there's a shortage of talent. Uh, we're constantly looking for talent in this space. I don't think that's any different than any other tech company in this space. Uh, and there was one other point I had on this is that, oh, I guess with COVID, maybe that's unlocked a little bit. You can look for people in different geographies, but there's always there's always a shortage. Everyone is there. looking. You never Everyone's it. looking. It's uh, I'm sure as you know, with your portfolio <laughs> companies, there's always just this war, like maybe it'll get a little bit better uh, if we have a little bit of a recession. Those are always some of the best times. My first company was started in a recession and it was a great time to have uh, to hire talent. So that sometimes can actually be almost beneficial for uh, startups and that's the ones that are starting to break through can actually get a little bit easier access for talent. And um, there's this... Um kind of like ever growing promise of maybe technology is going to enable, like you do more with less, yep. but it feels like you still need a talent to think through the hard problems. That oh are hard applications yeah. Like, like right? some of these problems are just so hard that like, you can't brute force your way through them. You just need certain talents to, to make it happen. And it, it's no different at Rhombus. It's, it's something where you just need great talents and we're fortunate to have a very talented team. That's great. Yeah. The, um, so again, like thinking about the building blocks of yeah. uh, of a good computer vision application, uh, you, you do have the evolution going on in algorithms and, and being more efficient there. You have the, the talent, but then there's the data component. Yeah. And um, I know maybe we don't agree on everything on that <laughs> end, but um, it feels like there's, uh, if you think about the, the best applications that are coming with maybe more accurate yeah. or, um, or I don't know, maybe the use case itself is 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 it's it's kind of like ripe for a very proprietary data set. Yeah. Uh, how much of a differentiation do you think is going to be having access to large data sets in order to train your AI and computer vision model to be more effective in, in delivering uh, uh, the ultimate use case and solution? Yeah. And just to give some context for the listeners, Diego and I were having a conversation the other day. This was one area we had some disagreement on and uh, <laughs> some intellectual conversation uh, trying to get to a better place. And so 
Uh, just to back up again for the listeners, what Diego is alluding to is in computer vision, a key component is data labeling. And so uh, in order for essentially the machines and the computers to learn, it is heavily reliant on uh, essentially people, a lot of times people in the middle labeling images. And so they'll go through and they'll say, this is, uh, I'm lacking uh, good examples here, but this is a blue chair. This is a gray desk and this is a backpack and this is a shirt. And like, there's just millions of labels. And they often say in computer vision, you're only as good as your data sets. And so like the actual data behind it is sometimes more important than say maybe the algorithm. And so to have a really good data set is really important. And so uh, I think what you're getting to is, you know, how important is this for companies and for differentiation? And if you go on Twitter, sometimes you'll say, see that uh, the most valuable uh, thing to a computer vision company or to companies in the future, it doesn't have to be a computer vision company, might actually be the data sets and not so much like the algorithms and all that. I have uh, maybe a slightly different opinion. I think they're, I, I don't disagree. I think the data sets are really important. I do think that in some industries, data sets will become commoditized. And that's why like with a lot of industries, they'll become so highly competitive that those data sets will essentially get licensed. So like in some industries, and I'll pick on self-driving just because it's something that someone that some people know really well is that some companies uh, will get such impressive data sets, they'll might license it out so that uh, other companies could build off on top of it. And that's not to say that the company that has the data set won't be super valuable in itself. Uh, but companies will build off of that data set and essentially build, you know, maybe uh, Apple builds its own self-driving car. They don't have the data set, but they're licensing a really good one. Mm -hmm. uh, but in other industries, it'll be really hard to get the data sets because it's not something that is uh, really competitive, like self-driving cars. So those companies, their whole differentiation will be the data set because no one else is building those data sets. We see it a little bit in our field where uh, you know, there's some really niche use cases and only a company or two has that data set. So it really depends of, uh, what industry you're in, how valuable that data set will be, or maybe I should say like how quickly it'll become commoditized. Like in some industries, it might be commoditized in a year and in other industries it might take 15 years. I think I went on a way long tangent here. <laughs> maybe I got off topic so you can bring me back on topic. No, this is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is exactly what I was thinking about, but yeah. Um, it feels to me like to your uh, kind of like lead advantage of maybe you have access to a data set and no one, no one else yeah. has. You capture in a way, I don't know, maybe on a retail space, you were able yeah. to capture like the shelf in a way that no one else has. And yeah. your algorithm is ultimately more precise than anyone can be with yeah. other capture devices. And I feel like there's, a, there's an interesting period of time I don't know, one year, five years, Yeah, it's a little bit uh, 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 up in the air where there is a lead uh, position for someone that has the data set. I don't know if, if that's how you- Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think it depends how competitive that industry is. So mm -hmm. I came from cybersecurity and the data sets were all about who has the most malware signatures. And it's a very competitive industry. So like if your algorithm or your data set was 97% accurate versus someone else that was 98%, the end result was the end consumer or the end buyer. It was really hard for them to differentiate between yours being 97% versus 98 or versus 96%. So in really, com in really competitive industries, I think the advantage of that data set will be very condensed. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually the value will be in the applications built on top of it. So it, especially like, again, if you take cybersecurity, the value is on the companies that essentially build on top of the data sets and they're building really good solutions that might be the same in like say self-driving cars. Uh, and then there will be other industries where the data set is the competitive advantage because, and it will be that way for five or 10 years because it's really niche. Maybe it's something like uh, underwater identification of fish and like their health. And like, I know that there's computer vision algorithms for that, like super cool things, super niche, like, and not to say that they won't, there won't be a great company built there, uh, but they might have a competitive advantage on their data set for five or 10 years. So I just, I think it comes down to competition. Mm -hmm. And if it's a super competitive industry, then it'll quickly scale up to, okay, what's the applications that are built on top of it and what value do those uh, deliver? Does that sort of make sense? That makes sense. And I think yeah. it kind of like ties together to maybe the, the differentiation of the data will enable someone to build the applications faster. Yep. 
and build yeah. their ROI faster. Totally. And they could get them a head start and essentially get them, uh, get them uh, top of mind for the initial customer. So it is a way to like propel out in front. Yeah. Uh, but I do think, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. That's a lot. And we'll probably get to this in a little bit. A lot of these computer vision algorithms and data sets are really beneficial for the productivity of I'll say the whole world. Like yeah. if we all have self-driving cars, I would have really appreciated that this morning. Cause it probably would have lessened <laughs> my commute. Yeah. And so some of these, it's not even the worst thing. Like you almost want it to be commoditized uh, to happen quicker. And like the example that we were talking about yesterday is that uh, a lot of us startups, we build off of like AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft, uh, their cloud platform. And in a way you could say that those are somewhat commoditized. And because if I was to go build one today, like, is there that much of a difference between Google Cloud and, and AWS? Probably not, but like those companies are massive and like yeah. they've built massive companies. And now the applications, they're enabling like all these startups to build off of them, which you could say like the market cap of AWS and Google Cloud, like it's this much but the market cap of the companies built on top of them is even more massive. So like that service, even though it's somewhat commoditized is hugely valuable to the world. And I'd say the same with like computer vision and the data sets that will come out of it. Like the value and the market cap of those things might be this big and it's hugely valuable to the world, but like the applications that we've built off of it will be even more valuable and uh, much bigger. So, and it comes back to your question of like building blocks. It's, it's an essential building block to have those data sets. No, I, 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 I agree hundred percent with you. I think it's, it's super interesting. And then maybe a, a good next topic to touch on is, can you think about, or help us think about after assuming that we have those building blocks in place, yeah. how do you go from that layer of, you know, like data capture, annotation, training algorithms, getting precision and whatnot mm -hmm. to uh, really delivering the ROI for the customer and then actually having that application in the hands of the, those customers. Yeah. I mean, with any startup, uh, I mean, the famous term that all startups and venture investors knows is just like product market fit, like delivering value. Like you can go have cool technology. There's all types of cool thing us as engineers like to build, but at the end of the day, there's not value unless someone's willing to part with their money in their wallet uh, and give that to you. I think in computer vision, there's a lot of, we're in the early days of the technology. Uh, there's a lot of promise. There's a lot of sci-fi. I can tell you customers come in all the time to us saying like, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if you could do something out of like Minority Report and see Diego here and then like see what he was doing and all this stuff. And like, there's a lot of sci-fi there still, but at the end of the day, you got to deliver value. You got to deliver where the customers actually uh, want to give something, uh, want to actually pay for the service and more importantly, use the service. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think there'll probably be a lot of trial and error over the next few years of finding what those, what those services are for the customer. Uh, cause I, even the customers don't always know, like they'll ask, they'll say, oh, this would sounds really cool. Like, wouldn't this be really, uh, cool if this, we could do this, but, uh, it, they don't really know that it's not possible today yet. Uh, and something we didn't talk about, like there's a difference in computer vision today of under like looking at an image and saying, oh, there's Diego in there, or that's a dog, or that's a backpack. And there's a, there's a difference between that and knowing intent. And mm -hmm. the intent is something that's really hard. And the intent, some people think like with computer vision, you can uh, tease that out, but it's, it's still really hard for a computer to know, like, are there kids on the playground and are they playing or is bowling going on? And that's really hard to know. Or like, is uh, like a ball got thrown in the street and there's a kid that threw the ball in the street. And it's really hard for a computer to know like, oh, the kid might go chase the ball in the street. I should probably slow down. And like that intent is something that humans are still best at. But when it comes to like just recognizing, is it a giraffe in the video or in a image, like computers are what you see today are almost on par with a human and being able to identify that. And then, so it feels like this is almost like a, 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 the next generation, the next leap in computer vision, which is not just like knowing what's in a static image or like even on a video, mm -hmm. but it kind of like identifying the intent and, and kind of like almost predicting what's going to happen next. And yeah. uh, do you see any interesting innovation, innovation happening right now on that space or still very much a black box, how that problem is going to be solved. I think it's very much a black box. I'm sure there's research again, back to what we were talking about earlier, academia probably has research going on in this. It's probably a ways away. We're probably like, if you think of like cycles of innovation, there's the current 
uh, CNN that I mentioned, uh, innovation of like actually being able to identify what's in an image. Uh, but the actual to pull out intent is a really hard problem. Humans are good at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know that for kind of that example I gave, like a kid throws a ball into the street. How does a computer know? Like we know that the, the kid might uh, try to jump into the street to go chase the ball, but it's really hard for a computer to, to know that right now. And I don't see anything on the immediate horizon. Maybe one of the listeners uh, <laughs> knows of a project uh, that's trying to do that or can do that well. The problem with that stuff is, yes, like I'm sure people can show demos and it can work in narrow use cases. But way back to our conversation before about data sets, it's really hard to get data sets on that. And you can get data sets on still images, but to get data sets on intent, like that just doesn't exist today. And one of the reasons CNN or one of the reasons computer vision took off is we got these huge data sets on say static images. Like, mm -hmm. is it a giraffe? What kind of giraffe is it? Uh, but there's not data sets on necessarily intent. And that's probably a really hard problem. And maybe that needs another leap forward in a bunch of other technologies. Like with computer vision, we had a leap forward in data sets. We had a leap forward in GPUs, mm -hmm. uh, just general infrastructure compute power. And it might be that we need another leap forward in just all the technology stack in order to understand intent. But once you understand intent, you can even do more exciting things. Again, back to the bowling use case, you have cameras watching the school playground and actually be able to alert teachers like, hey, this kid's being bullied. A, kid, a teacher needs to get out there now, but I don't think we're not there today. Mm -hmm. But that is something that's cool that will eventually happen. I have no doubt about that. I just don't know if it's five years from now or 20 years from now. Yeah, I, I think like everyone looks to like innovation and interesting things going on in the field of AI computer vision as a whole. And you see like GPT-3 and DALI happening and people getting super excited about image to text, text to image, what's next. Yeah. It feels like people are thinking, oh, maybe this is version, I don't know, 1.5 getting to 2.0. Yeah. But uh, what is uh, what is your thought on it? Do you think it's, it is kind of like middle of the way there or is still like very nascent? It's more like a, a feature in the current situation. Well, I don't want to take away from those things because they are super cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, for those that haven't played with GPT-3, Dolly, or uh, recently Stable Diffusion, which is the open source version or the open source version, open source version of uh, Dolly. Uh, those are, it's just really cool. And just kind of background for the listeners, it's the ability to, with a text prompt, to uh, generate an image. So like, what would be a cool text prompt? Like dogs playing football on Mars on Mars. Yeah. And it will just like generate images of that. And it's uh, super cool. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be uh, applications built on top of it. And, uh, and so like, I, I think all of these are like necessary progress. And I think like these types of things like Dolly and uh, stable diffusion came around much faster than people expected. Like who would have expected that, you know, maybe you could start doing graphic design through a computer. I wouldn't have guessed that like three or four years ago. Uh, but again, I think like these are built off the notion of uh, static images and like, there's not in it's, there's not intense. Like you can't go the other way and say, Hey, computer, tell me what's going on in this video. Like, it's really tough for that, especially like to can get emotions out of that yeah. and all those things. So, uh, I think those, those projects though, by themselves, applications would be built off. Actually, one thing we were talking about, uh, right before this was that, uh, Getty images announced yesterday that, uh, they weren't going to take uploads from anything like Dolly or stable diffusion. So something of stuff is going to get disrupted out of all this really <laughs> quickly. I don't, I can't predict what's going to come out of this, but I think uh, projects like this are going to be super interesting and uh, cause areas of opportunity for a lot of people. No, that's, um, and also the impact of the current way that people, you know, as you mentioned, like getting image, how people buy and sell and, and yeah. transact around uh, like images produced by humans right now, but eventually by, by machines. Yeah, maybe it disrupts Getty Images because it's like, oh, I saw that image of someone holding a cell phone. Well, I'll just generate it myself. Like, I don't need to go pay someone else for it. Like, it's crazy, but back to our other conversation, like you would have thought if you would have asked three months ago, I don't remember when Dolly was released, you'd be like, oh, that's years yeah. ahead of anyone yeah. else. And yet here we are like three months after it's released, there's already an open source version that's from everything I saw is actually really cool. And uh, I, don't, I don't wanna compare like if one is better than the other, but like maybe a viable alternative to uh, a proprietary version. So, and that yeah. was only like three or four months later. 
That's uh, that's super interesting. The yeah. so let me turn quickly to a question that we got from from the audience, which I thought it was really interesting. Um, they were asking, how do you recommend maybe new companies thinking about data sets and 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 gathering new data sets versus leveraging what's out there? Yeah, it's it's more like an open ended. Do you think there's still value on gathering data sets to our previous questions, or do you think yeah. they can already start like step two of it? Yeah, so I think it totally depends on what you're building. Uh, let's say if I was trying to build a self-driving car company today, I would probably go try to find as many open data sets that there are today because I think someone is probably licensing that data. Uh, just like 10 years ago, if you were starting a maps provider, like would you try to get all that data uh, yourself or would you just leverage someone that's already there and build essentially your company on top of that? Uh, but if you're doing something super niche, which I think there's going to be tons of uh, companies that are built off of very proprietary data sets, then you have to go build the data set yourself. So let's say you're building something to identify turtles and like, you know, if they're healthy or not, like you probably are going to have to go build that data set. And like the, uh, the differentiator of your company is that data set versus if you're doing self-driving cars, I don't know if I'd want my differentiator to be the data set or like the actual application on top of that. So it really depends on the industry, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I know we have a few more minutes and I had a couple questions that I really want to ask you. Yeah. The, uh, one of them is when we're, when we're talking about the real applications and, and delivering value to the customers, it feels like there's still like almost like the technology took a couple of leaps forward ahead of the customers right now. Yeah. Like we can do more than 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 what customers know or can imagine. Do you think right now the limitation is actually our kind of like imagination ability to code and make it happen? Yeah. Or uh, or do you think it's, it's it's they're going on par basically? Yeah, no, I think really the limitation is uh our imagination at this point. I think there's so much that can be done with computer vision. I think companies like us need to start building those applications, those workflows, like actually make the computer vision useful, like go from Dolly and like generating cool images to like, okay, what's the workflow? Like what's the, what's the end application to the user that's gonna actually provide a lot of value. And, and then like, if you take one step further, how do you think about how big this market can be or how big this market is already yeah. that, uh, that we're tapping into um, to just make it happen, those levels of applications? Yeah, I think this is a good question. I'm very biased in this, so <laughs> uh, take my response with a grain of salt, but I don't think people appreciate how big this market's going to be. I mean, I, it's massive. I don't think there's anything out there that can capture the TAM. And the reason, and TAM by that, I mean total addressable market, is that I think as computer vision improves here, which it's improving at a very fast pace, it's already improved enough to do a lot of things, is the levels of productivity improvement it can add to society, the amount of uh, security, like we do security, uh, video security, making sure essentially give you more visibility into your office spaces, into uh, like your educational facilities, like the amount of help that it can have, have to society, I think is enormous. And just to give some examples, like. Maybe you have cameras up in a retail store and you want to know how many customers you're getting, how often they're dwelling in certain places. Like that would be helpful. Uh, maybe you have a construction site and you want to know if people are wearing hard hats. Are they in places that they're not supposed to be? You can think about schools and all the school safety issues, like how much help it is to have uh, essentially cameras and computers that can interpret the world, that can actually see issues, that can report those issues to people. Like that is really hard to address how big that market can be. And so you know, the conservative side says to me, like that market is so untapped and it's going to be incredibly large over time. Again, I am a, a slightly biased <laughs> observer in this industry, but I don't think people quite uh, appreciate how big this is going to be and how many massive companies are going to be built in all different types of ways uh, that are leveraging computer vision in some way or another. This is really interesting, Gary. Yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks for sharing the vision. Thanks for the time. Uh, and uh, we have a disclaimer to show to the audience right now. So um, this has been super fun. Thank you. Thanks yeah, this has been there. great. Let's do it again. Yes. <laughs> I'll just put the disclaimer up and thank you everyone for attending.